Imagine a world where your great grandchildren are not just distant abstract concepts you will never meet, but people you will play tennis with in your prime. Imagine a reality where the inevitable decline we associate with getting older, the frailty, the memory loss, the pain is not inevitable at all. We are conditioned to believe that life has a natural arc. You are born, you grow, you age, you wither, and you die. We accept this as the fundamental law of the universe. But what if I told you that everything we think we know about that arc is wrong? What if aging is not a natural consequence of time, but a glitch? A glitch that we can fix. It sounds like science fiction, Alex. Or perhaps the opening to a movie about a dystopian future where the rich live forever. But this isn't fiction. We are diving deep into the work of Dr. David Sinclair, a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. The book is called Lifespan, and it is arguably one of the most provocative and scientifically grounded challenges to the status quo of biology ever written. Sinclair argues something radical. He says aging is a disease, and like any disease, it can be treated. It can be slowed, and, terrifyingly or wonderfully depending on your perspective, it can be reversed. I have to admit, Sarah, when I first picked this up, my skepticism meter was redlining. We have heard snake oil salesmen pitching the fountain of youth for thousands of years. From Ponce de Leon hacking through the Florida bush to modern billionaires injecting themselves with whatever the latest experimental serum is. It always feels like vanity. But Sinclair starts somewhere very different. He starts with a story about his grandmother, Vera. It wasn't about vanity for him. It was about witnessing the tragedy of the end. Right. And that emotional anchor is crucial because it frames the science not as a quest for immortality, but as a quest for humanity. He describes his grandmother Vera as this vibrant, bohemian woman who escaped Hungary after the war, who swam in icy lakes and drove cars while dancing to the radio. She told him to never grow up. She lived with this intense vitality. But then, the clock ticked. By her mid-80 seconds, she was a shell. Sinclair describes the end of her life as violent, not violent in the sense of a car crash, but violent in what biology does to a person. He talks about how we sanitize death, we say someone died peacefully of old age, but biologically, cells are screaming for oxygen, toxins are accumulating, and memories are being erased. He looked at that suffering and asked a question most of us are too afraid to ask. Why do we accept this? That passage really hit me. He mentions that we treat death as a tragedy for children, but for the elderly, we just shrug and say, well, they had a good run. But Sinclair points out that the person his grandmother was had effectively died years before her body did. This distinction is what he calls the difference between lifespan, how long you are alive, and health span, how long you are actually healthy and functioning. We have gotten very good at extending lifespan with modern medicine. We keep hearts beating. We keep lungs inflating but we haven't extended health span at the same rate. We have just extended the period of dying. We spend the last 10 or 20 years of life in a state of managed decay. Exactly. And that is the core mission of this book. It is not just about adding years. It is about squaring the curve. It is about living with the vitality of a three zero year old until you are 90 or 100. And then perhaps having a very quick decline at the very end. But to do that, we have to understand the mechanism. We have to understand why we age in the first place. And this is where Sinclair takes us on a time travel trip, not just back to his childhood, but back four billion years. To the primordial soup. This was the part where my brain started to hurt a little, but in a good way. He introduces us to this hypothetical organism called M. superstes, Magna superstes, the great survivor. It sounds like a gladiator, but it's basically a microscopic blob of slime in a drying pond on ancient Earth. Why is this little blob so important to me getting gray hair? Because, Alex, you are M. Superstess. Or rather, you are its great, great, great billionth grandchild. This is the foundation of Sinclair's theory. In this primordial soup, life was brutal. Radiation, heat, drying out. To survive, this organism evolved a very specific genetic circuit. It had two genes. Let's call them gene A and gene B. Gene A is a caretaker. 
It stops the cell from reproducing when times are tough, like a dry season. Gene B makes a silencing protein. Normally, this protein sits on gene A and keeps it quiet, allowing the cell to reproduce and grow when times are good. So, good times equal reproduction. Okay, so gene B is the boss that lets the party happen. But what happens when the party gets crashed by radiation? Here is the genius of evolution. Gene B has a second job. If the DNA gets damaged, say by cosmic rays, or just the wear and tear of existence, the protein from gene B leaves its post at gene A and rushes over to fix the broken DNA. It's like a repair crew. But here is the catch. When the repair crew leaves gene A to go fix the break, gene A wakes up. And remember what gene A does? It stops reproduction. It hunkers down. It puts the cell into survival mode. Once the DNA is fixed, the gene B protein returns to its post, silences gene A, and reproduction starts again. So it's a trade-off. You can't reproduce and repair at the same time. You have to choose. This is the survival circuit. Precisely. And we have inherited this exact circuit. In our bodies, gene B has evolved into a family of genes called sirtuins. You might have heard of them in relation to red wine or resveratrol. Sirtuins are the descendants of that ancient repair crew. They are enzymes that control our health, our fitness, and our survival. They manage inflammation, they protect our DNA, they boost our mitochondria, but they are needy. They require a fuel source called NAD. Without NAD, the sirtuins can't work. And as we age, our NAD levels drop. That's one part of the problem. So if sirtuins are the repair crew and they run out of gas NAD, then the repairs don't happen. That makes sense. But Sinclair goes deeper than just running out of gas. He introduces the information theory of aging. This was the part that blew my mind because he uses a metaphor that anyone who grew up in the 90 seconds will understand. The scratched DVD or CD for the slightly older crowd. The DVD analogy is brilliant. To understand it, we have to distinguish between two types of information in the body. First, there is the digital information. That's your DNA. The as, t's, c's, and g's. It's a code, just like the binary code on a computer or a DVD. For a long time, scientists thought aging was caused by mutations, changes to that code, like bit rot. But Sinclair says no. Cloning proves this wrong. You can take a cell from an old animal, clone it, and get a perfectly healthy, young animal. That means the original digital code is still there, intact. The manual is still in the library. Right. So, if the code isn't lost, why do we get old? That's where the second type of information comes in. The analog information. The epigenome. Yes. If the genome is the piano, the epigenome is the pianist. The genome is the hardware. The epigenome is the software that tells the cells which genes to play. Every cell in your body has the exact same DNA. A skin cell has the same DNA as a brain neuron. The only reason a skin cell acts like a skin cell and not a neuron is because the epigenome tells it which genes to turn on and which to keep silent. It's the conductor of the orchestra. So, aging is the pianist getting drunk? Or maybe the sheet music getting smudged? It's the pianist getting distracted. Remember the survival circuit? Sirtuins, the repair crew, are part of that epigenetic control system. They are the ones bundling up the DNA, keeping the genes silent that need to be silent. But every time your DNA gets damaged from UV rays, from X-rays, even just from living the sirtuins, have to leave their post to go fix the break. They run off to the site of the emergency. Usually, they come back. But over time, after millions of emergencies, they start getting lost. They don't find their way back to the right spot. They stop silencing the genes they are supposed to silence. So the skin cell starts playing the wrong notes. Maybe it starts playing a few kidney cell notes or liver cell notes. It loses its identity. This is what Sinclair calls epigenetic noise. Exactly. The DVD gets scratched. The laser can't read the track anymore. The music skips. The cell forgets what it is supposed to be. It becomes a senescent cell, a zombie cell that just sits there causing inflammation, or it stops functioning correctly. Multiply that by billions of cells, and you get gray hair, wrinkles, organ failure. You get aging. It is a loss of information. But, and this is the huge but, Sinclair believes that because the digital code, the DNA, is still intact, we can polish the scratch. 
We can reboot the software. We can remind the cell what it was when it was young. And he didn't just theorize this. He proved it. This is where we get to the ice mouse. And no, that's not a mouse made of frozen water. It stands for inducible changes to the epigenome. This experiment sounds almost cruel, but the results are undeniable. Tell us about the mouse, Sarah. This was the smoking gun. Sinclair's team engineered mice where they could induce DNA breaks just scratches, not mutations at will. They essentially distracted the repair crew on purpose. They simulated a lifetime of wear and tear in a matter of weeks. And the result? The mice got old. Fast. They went gray. They lost muscle. They got cataracts. They got arthritis. Physically, biologically, they aged. They proved that epigenetic noise causes aging. But if they could break it, could they fix it? That's the billion-dollar question. Yes, and they did. Using a gene therapy technique involving factors normally used in stem cells, essentially a reset switch, they were able to restore the vision of old mice. They took mice with glaucoma and crushed optic nerves. And by resetting the epigenetic markers by polishing the scratch on the DVD, the nerves grew back. The mice could see again. Their cells literally became young again. Not just repaired old cells, but young cells. They turned back the clock. It is mind-bending. But it brings us to the most controversial part of the book, the philosophical shift. Sinclair argues that we need to stop looking at cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's as separate problems. He calls it whack-a-mole medicine. We beat down one disease, and another one pops up a few years later because the underlying cause, aging, is still there. It is a powerful analogy. Imagine a dam is breaking. You can run around plugging individual holes that's treating cancer or heart disease. But the water pressure is still rising. That pressure is aging. If we cure cancer completely, every single type of cancer, do you know how much longer the average human lifespan would increase? About two years. That's it. Because if cancer doesn't get you at 85, heart failure or dementia is waiting right behind the door. Sinclair says we are targeting the symptoms, not the cause. If we treat aging itself, if we lower the water pressure, we delay all those diseases at once. But calling aging a disease makes people uncomfortable. It feels semantic, but it has huge real-world implications. If aging is natural, insurance doesn't cover it. The FDA doesn't approve drugs for it. Doctors don't treat it. They just say, well, you're 80? What do you expect? Sinclair uses a fascinating thought experiment here. He imagines a virus. Let's call it Virus X. It infects everyone at birth. It lies dormant for decades, but slowly it starts destroying your organs, clouding your eyes, weakening your muscles. And eventually, it kills you. Everyone has it. Would we say, oh, that's just natural? No. We would mobilize every resource on the planet to cure Virus X. We would call it the greatest plague in history. But because we call it aging, we accept it. He challenges the definition of disease. Currently, a condition is a disease only if it affects less than half the population. Since aging affects everyone, it's not a disease. It's normal. Sinclair says that's ridiculous. Just because something is common doesn't mean it's acceptable. So if we accept the premise aging is a disease and we have the potential tools to treat it, what can we actually do right now? Most of us can't inject gene therapies or access experimental labs. Sinclair doesn't leave us hanging. He actually practices what he preaches. And a lot of it comes back to that survival circuit. We need to trick our bodies into thinking times are tough so the repair crew gets to work. And the number one way to do that? Stop eating so much. Yes, intermittent fasting or calorie restriction. It is the most robust, proven way to extend life in almost every organism we've tested, from yeast to monkeys. When you are hungry, not starving, but hungry, your body senses a lack of resources. It triggers the sirtuins. It says, hey, no food coming in. We better preserve what we have. Repair the DNA. Recycle the junk proteins. It puts the body into high alert survival mode. In our modern world of abundance, where we eat three meals a day plus snacks, our bodies are constantly in growth mode. We never give the repair crew a shift. We are essentially eating ourselves to death by never being hungry. He talks about being on the razor's edge. Not malnutrition, but just enough stress to keep the body fighting. It is the concept of hormesis. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
This applies to cold exposure, heat exposure like saunas, and high intensity exercise. All these things stress the body just enough to wake up those longevity genes. It's like a fire drill for your cells. Exactly. We are too comfortable. We live in climate controlled boxes. We eat processed caloric bombs. We sit in chairs. We have sedated our survival circuits. Sinclair's personal regimen is fascinating. He skips breakfast. He tries to keep his BMI low. He exercises to get his breath rate up. He takes cold plunges. But he also mentions molecules. Resveratrol, NMN, metformin. These are compounds that mimic the effects of fasting and exercise. They are chemical switches for the sirtuins. Now, we have to be careful. He is a scientist, not a medical doctor giving prescriptions. And the science on humans is still catching up to the mouse studies. But the mechanism is sound. We are on the verge of a pharmaceutical revolution where we might take a pill that mimics a five mile run or a week of fasting. It is a hopeful vision, but also a disruptive one. If we all live to be 120 or 150, what does that do to society? To retirement? To overpopulation? Sinclair touches on this, arguing that healthy people contribute. They don't drain resources like sick elderly people do. A 100 year old who can work and think and play is an asset, not a liability. But it requires a total rethink of how we structure our lives. And that brings us back to the start the grandmother. The tragedy is not death itself. It is the loss of potential. It is the suffering. Sinclair believes we are at a turning point, like the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. For most of human history, flight was impossible. Until it wasn't. Aging feels inevitable. Until it isn't. We are the first generation in history to understand the code of life well enough to hack it. We might not be immortal, but we don't have to go gently into that good night. We can fight, we can repair, we can live. A glitch we can fix. I like that. It makes the future feel a lot more open. If you want to know how to keep your own piano player sober and your DVD scratch free, Lifespan is the manual. Sarah, this has been a mind-expanding deep dive. Thanks for walking us through the biology of tomorrow. My pleasure, Alex. Here's to making our health span match our lifespan. See you next time.